Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. In this morning's lesson from the prophet Isaiah, we hear the beginning of what becomes a new journey in the life of God's people. As we read throughout scripture, we learn of all the mountains and the valleys, the highs and the lows of the journeys of God's people. There are seasons of paradise and promise, followed by seasons of journey and even captivity. Then from captivity to liberation and back into the wilderness for yet another journey. In and out, up and down, promised land and exile. The journey of God's people is only predictable in the sense that it is always in motion. It is always journeying somewhere for some season of time. And in today's lesson from Isaiah, we pick up at an interesting starting point. Scholars describe chapter 40 as the beginning of the book of 2nd Isaiah. This is to say that the book of Isaiah developed over the course of a few centuries and that chapter 40 marks a place where the authorship and experience were different than that of the previous chapters. Dr. Brugman describes the historical gap between chapter 39 and chapter 40 as about 200 years. And in that gap of time, Babylon rose to power and sent Israel and all of Jerusalem into exile. They were cast out from their homeland, and that is where the author of chapter 40 is writing, from outside the promised land. Dr. Brueggemann and other scholars also note that the move from chapter 39 to chapter 40 is a dramatic jump in themes in Isaiah as well. Generally speaking, chapters 1 through 39 speak to a great deal of judgment on Jerusalem. As a series of world powers take their turns ruling over Israel, God's judgment is being enacted upon the unfaithfulness of God's people. But as chapter 40 begins, we start to hear a different message. A message of hope begins to emerge. Quote, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill made low. An uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. It is in the wilderness that the way is prepared. The wilderness reality and metaphor has again become the means by which God will bring about something new. The roads which were painfully steep to climb and depressingly low to descend will be made level and straight. What was the burden of the journey would become the pathway to restoration. The life in exile in Babylon would soon become the promised land once again. These themes that we find in Isaiah, judgment and hope, or captivity and freedom, these are themes which transcend both scripture and our daily lives. The realities of isolation, pain, loss, being held captive either by choices we make ourselves or choices others impose on us. These realities often beg us to ask, how did I get here? Where is God At times like this, we all know only too well our own experiences of captivity. Though, too, the realities of healing, reconciliation, hope, and peace are present in our lives as they are in Scripture. And the presence of these experiences of freedom often come in ways that we have no explanation for. Ways that we can only be ascribed to the grace and mercy of a power higher than ourselves. And in between those experiences is this tightrope with tension. It's a balancing act to walk across. Perhaps that is why we look to God 
to help make the rough places plain, to help lift up the valleys and bring low the mountains. Because the hope that we carry within us does contain indeed an understanding of what we have come to know, but also a desire for what we long to experience. What we hear in Isaiah today is a turning point in the journey of hope for Israel. Today, in this season of Advent, I wonder what might be our own turning points toward our journeys for hope. As Father Sandy mentioned earlier in his announcements, if you come back tonight for the 5.30 service, you'll experience a liturgy around the O antiphons. It is those moments in the song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, in which we are given a new descriptor of how God comes into our lives and into the world. Emmanuel, wisdom from on high, key of David. And it is in this hymn that there is an ancient devotion that has been practiced throughout the centuries. In this devotion, the hymn is sung one verse at a time for each night starting on December 17th, going through December 23rd. And in the original Latin, once all of these verses are sung by the end of the last night, an acrostic forms, utilizing the first letter and all of the words after the O. The acrostic spells ero cras, which is the Latin phrase meaning I shall be present tomorrow. I shall be present tomorrow. What greater hope is there for our journey than to know Christ is near and will be present with us for the great tomorrows of our lives. Those moments when we realize we are moving out of captivities and into the freedom of a Savior who brings us to himself. A Savior who brings the hope of a child, the healing of a great physician, and the renewal of a creator God. Let us pray, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Amen.